good morning again. Uh, my, my name is David Hoovler. Uh, for those of you I don't know quite so well, um, I serve as campus pastor here at Elyria Friends, and uh, it is good to be together this morning. Uh, as we're moving toward Easter this, this month throughout March, we're looking at some of the people involved in the plot against Jesus of Nazareth at the Passover festival 2,000 years ago. Some of those people were plotting against him intentionally. They were doing, doing that intentionally, but others were drawn into that plot despite their best intentions. And so as we do that, we're looking at how we also need to examine ourselves in this season and how we can be reminded of the hope that we have because of the way God worked through the midst of that plot. And so this morning we are looking at uh, Simon Peter, and we're turning to Luke chapter 22. And so if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn there. Uh, the words will be up on the screen, but I'd, uh, always good to have it, have it open in front of you. So Luke 22, I'll begin with verse 31. Uh, and as you're able, I invite you to stand as we open God's word together. Jesus is speaking here. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. May God add his blessing to this word. Please be seated. Last week we were looking at how the religious leaders decided that Jesus needed to die because of their envy of him and their focus on holding on to their place and their nation, the ways that their religion, their power and their politics had become idols to them. But this week we're looking at somebody who had no intention of being in a, in a plot against Jesus. Simon Peter was one of his closest friends. He was a devoted disciple. In fact, he wasn't just one of the twelve apostles, he was one of the three, Peter, James, and John, Jesus' inner circle. So how is it that instead of standing up for his teacher, his friend, his Lord, Peter comes to deny that he even knows him? Well, that's what I'd like to look at today, and, and at some of the lessons that Peter's story has for each one of us today. First thing I'd like us to see right at the very beginning of what Jesus says is that there is more going on than we know. Jesus here pulls back a curtain into a world that we honestly know very few details about. And so we need to be careful not to obsess over the spiritual realm of angels and demons like some people have a tendency to do. Jesus doesn't give room for that. He talks about it very matter-of-factly. We may not understand it, but he knows it. He dwells in it. In fact, he created that realm. So what does he reveal to us? Well, a couple of things. First, he says that Satan has demanded something. What's important to see here is that Satan has asked. He needed permission. The Bible is very clear that our faith is not dualism. There is a clash between good and evil, light and darkness, but it's not a battle of equals. God is in control. Satan may be in rebellion, he may achieve some victories, but as the old hymn says, lo, his doom is sure. You know, Jesus' statement carries echoes of the books of Job and Zechariah, which actually refer to the Satan. It's a description more than it is a name. 
He's actually among the angelic figures appearing before the throne of God in the heavenly courts. He's shown accusing people, kind of like a prosecuting attorney. But he's on a leash. He operates only within the boundaries that he has been allowed by God. And so I suppose that kind of begs the question, well, why then does he have any authority at all? Well, it's us. Way back in Genesis, we're told that humans were given dominion over creation, but when we turned from God, we yielded this world to Satan instead of yielding to God. And so because of our actions, Satan has room to operate in rebellion among us in this age until Jesus returns and sets everything straight again. Satan asked to sift all of you, Jesus says. And actually, the the NIV translation that I read from adds a few words in these verses to clarify what's going on. Some of your translations, if you have it in front of you, may have just said, uh, Satan has asked to sift you as weak, but I have prayed for you that you may not, your faith may not fail. The NIV explains it a little bit more because English doesn't distinguish between singular and plural you. It's one of the big deficiencies that we have in the language, at, at least in some dialects. Um, I grew up in western Pennsylvania, and so I know if you want to talk about more than one person, it's yins. And of course, if you're down south, it's y'all. And I, I learned marrying someone from Texas, I learned that that's not as far as it goes, because y'all is, is plural. But if I wanted to refer to the whole group, of course, that's all y'all. It's, it's, it's the whole thing. What Jesus is reminding us here is that all y'all need to be on guard. Peter would, in fact, later warn the church in one of his letters, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to de- devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the whole world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We're all a part of this battle. We're all a part of this sifting that Satan is wanting to be about. And he mentions here he asked to to sift the disciples like wheat, And that's not a process that that many of us are all that familiar with anymore, as we're a little more disconnected from uh, from farming in many cases. But the process is winnowing, separating the grain from the chaff, the husks and stalks, so that you have just the, the kernels of grain that can be used to make flour or whatever you do with them. In biblical times, this was done on threshing floors. You would have oxen who would go around on the threshing floors to trample down the grain and separate it, and then it would be up on a high hill, and you'd take a fork or a shovel, and you'd throw it up into the air, and the wind would blow the chaff away, and the grain would fall back to the ground. Or, as Ginger and I discovered, when we spent a little bit of time in a a rural part of China, Um, you can do this in some creative ways. There, they would just throw it on the roads, spread it across, and let the cars do what oxen used to do. Um, Cars would drive over it, break it down, and then they would get their shovels in, throw it up in the air, and it would blow the chaff away. It made us really wonder about the bread that we ate. Um, And and we we learned some, um, some new... Chinese vocabulary from the taxi drivers as they had to drive over this stuff, and you can see how it would get stuck up underneath all of the cars and all the suspension. Uh, It was really a pain. But Satan is demanding to test the disciples. He's, He's saying he wants to separate the wheat from the chaff and claim the straw as his own. What's interesting about that is in Jesus' parables, he claimed authority over this process, Jesus did. 
He said, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said it would be his angels doing this. Satan may be a fallen angel. He may seek to steal and kill and destroy, but he's only operating under Jesus' sovereign rule. And even through this Passover plot, Satan's best efforts were only accomplishing God's greater plan. And the very important thing for us to see is is not just that behind the scenes we have Satan's demand, but we also have Jesus' prayer. He reveals that he has also prayed for Peter. Satan accuses and winnows. Jesus intercedes and preserves. He prayed that Peter's faith may not fail. Satan did not crush Peter But that had nothing to do with Peter himself. It was because Jesus was praying for him. In in the book of Hebrews, we're told, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them, for you, for me. And Jesus will ultimately triumph over Satan, as we're told in the book of Revelation. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. So the point of what Jesus reveals to Peter about the spiritual activity at work behind the scenes isn't so that we can argue about how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. It isn't to fear demons behind every bush. It's to show that there is more going on than we know, but to reveal that Jesus is the one who's ultimately in control, and he is interceding for us. We also see in this brief exchange here that Jesus knows who we are, even when we don't. He knows Peter's overconfidence. Peter, of course, says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And I think he means it. He's full of bravado, but it's not just a boast. He actually is ready to fight for Jesus. If you know, in the garden, when Jesus was arrested, Peter swings a sword and cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. By the way, it occurs to me that if you're, if you're swinging a sword at somebody and you cut off the, their ear and that's all you do to them, you're either really good with the sword or you're completely on the other side of it. And all I have to say is Peter was a fisherman, so we probably know which side he came down on. But Peter doesn't really know himself. He's not ready for Jesus not to fight. So when Jesus surrenders, Peter turns and runs. He doesn't know what to do with this. He does follow Jesus into the house of the high priest, but he crumbles when he's identified as one of Jesus' followers. When when Ginger and I were at Asbury College, heard a few times one of the former presidents there, Dennis Kinlaw, an amazing speaker. And I remember one of the times that he spoke, he was referring to Peter and his denial of Jesus, and he talked about how this bold disciple, this natural leader, could not stand before the scorn of a servant girl. We too might think that we are strong. We may even think we're ready to fight for Jesus, but when we face scorn because we believe in him or for the things he calls us to do or not to do, when he calls us to sacrifice for him in those small moments of everyday life, 
you know, that's when we are usually most likely to crumble, just like Peter did. Jesus knows Peter's overconfidence, and he knows that Peter will falter. He warns Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me. He very specifically describes the exact timing of it, so Peter knows. And it's also interesting to see Jesus' use of Simon versus Peter through this exchange. Simon was actually his given name in Hebrew, Simeon, named after uh, one of the sons of Jacob. But Jesus gave him the nickname Peter, which meant rock or rocky. And here he begins by addressing him Simon. Simon. Doubles it for emphasis. Jesus is speaking to the old man here. He knows that Peter at that point is still Simon. And Simon is going to see that very clearly before the night is over. And so after Simon's bold, overconfident boast, Jesus pulls out his nickname, I think pretty ironically, I tell you, Rock, before the rooster crows today, you'll crumble. You'll deny three times that you even know me. Jesus knows Peter and his weakness even better than Peter knows himself. Jesus knows Peter. And he loves him anyway. And Jesus also knows that Peter is wheat, not chaff. Satan demanded to sift the disciples like wheat, separating the grain from the husks, the genuine from the false. And Jesus knows which one of those Peter is. In fact, Peter himself seems to reflect on this later. Again, writing to the church, he says... In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, it may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Satan doesn't make us wheat or chaff. But his actions can reveal the genuineness of our faith. And God doesn't permit that out of a desire to destroy our faith. He does it so that through the testing, our faith in Jesus may be proven to be genuine. So that we and others will give praise and glory and honor to Jesus when he is revealed. And Jesus knows Peter's faith is genuine. Earlier that same evening, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, Peter protested. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not every one was clean. Peter's bluster and weakness was on full display at that moment as well. But so was his love for Jesus. And Jesus knew that even though his faith and his love were imperfect, they were genuine. Because we see that there's more going on than we might know. And Jesus knows us even when we don't know ourselves. But another thing that Jesus wants to show us through this conversation with Peter is that a faltered faith is not a failed faith. I am not going to say that five times fast. <laughs> Peter is going to deny Jesus. He will stumble, he will falter. 
in that moment of weakness, he's going to crumble and swear with an oath that he doesn't have any idea who Jesus even is. His faith wasn't as strong as he thought it was. We can act as though we're somehow different than Peter, that we haven't faltered, that we don't need restoration, but that's a lie. But Jesus says that Peter will turn back. He says, I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Simon needs to recognize that he has faltered. It wouldn't be accurate for him to stop short in that, like the half-hearted sort of apology that a crooked politician might give. You know, mistakes were made, something like that. No, he needs to admit that his sin in denying Jesus was sin. As we're, Wilson and I are, are kind of reading through the Bible and we're in Leviticus, which is everybody's favorite part of the Bible. Um, and sometimes we might think that we can just kind of skip over that, that there's nothing relevant there for us anymore. But it stood out to me as we've been looking at some of that, the way that the, the Old Testament sacrificial system, how hands-on it was in the way that it portrayed sin, how, how tactile it was. Looking in Leviticus 5 and Leviticus 4, we're told, when anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. As a penalty for the sin they have committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering. They are to lay their hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it at the place of the burnt offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them, and they will be forgiven. The sacrifices of the old covenant applied when people recognized and confessed their sin. They would turn to God by going physically to the temple. Then they would place their hand on the head of the animal that they were sacrificing. They would identify with it, and then they would slaughter it to show that the penalty of sin is death in a very graphic way. Under the new covenant, there is still sacrifice. We aren't able to make ourselves clean but we still have a role to play. We still need to recognize and confess our sin. We need to turn to God. And just as the ancient Israelites would do with the lamb or the goat, we also need to identify with Jesus to say, this sin of mine nailed him to the cross. I slaughtered him, but his sacrifice was sufficient. He is infinitely greater than a lamb or a goat. So Jesus prayed that Simon's faith would not fail, and he knew the outcome. He knew the power of his intercession. He didn't say, if you turn back, Simon. He said, when you turn back. He knew Simon would falter, but he knew that his faith would not fail. And so he tells Peter that he has work to do. He says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew Peter would falter, but Jesus wasn't done with him yet. He still wanted Peter to serve and to lead. Just like Peter, we all will deny Jesus. We might call them big ways or small ways. The truth is they're all big. But he calls us to turn back, to find forgiveness, and to keep on serving him. It seems simple, but it occurs to me we usually mess this up in one of two ways. One of them is to treat sin lightly, 
acting as though it didn't happen or that it wasn't a big deal. A bit after this, one of Jesus' brothers named Jude, he was actually probably very close to Peter. They, they seem to have kind of cribbed from one another in some of their letters. But Jude wrote these directions and warnings to the church. He said, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. He says we're always to act with mercy. But we do need to take sin seriously, to guard ourselves against calling evil good, against falling into temptation ourselves as we seek to restore others. So one error is to treat sin lightly. The other error we can fall into is to treat forgiveness lightly. Again, Peter will write later, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. It's God who calls us, And it's God who will restore us. We can treat forgiveness lightly by wallowing in guilt and shame, doubting that Jesus' work was really sufficient for us. Or we can treat forgiveness lightly by not believing that Jesus really can restore other people, that people really can change. And by failing to forgive and restore people to fellowship, in Jesus' body, the church. The church must be a place of second chances. We must be a people who take sin seriously and who take Jesus' forgiveness just as seriously. Because when we falter, we need to turn back. And not just for our own sake. Jesus calls us to restore one another. As Paul says, as we press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So as we think about Simon Peter this day, be aware that there is more going on in your life than you know. And Jesus himself is on your side, interceding for you. He knows who you are better than you even know yourself. He knows your flaws. He knows you will falter. And he loves you anyway. And through our trials, he wants to prove to us the genuineness of our faith in him. Because even though we will falter, we can turn back. He leaves the door open for us. And we can strengthen one another in Christ, in the one who loved us, who died for us, and who gives us a living hope through his resurrection. Because Peter's story is my story. It can be your story. And that story, it's good news. Amen?